We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrevix. Joining me today is Jaime Carrasco, Portfolio Manager at Canaccord Genuity. How are you today, Jaime? Well, I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me back. Always a pleasure chatting with you. Always great. I know I I feel like a broken record saying always, always great to have you back, but... Well, you know, it, May, may, may we live in interesting times, right? And I think we definitely are. We're at the apex of, of some amazing times. But by the same token, you know, the, 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 the way Chinese write it, uh, when they write the word um, danger, crisis and opportunity. So we can pick away at both. Where's the crisis, but where are the opportunities? And again, you're one of the, one of the few that are touching on this topic uh, in conversations as opposed to interviews, which, you know, gives us a better format to, to chat about these things. Absolutely. And I think, you know, saying that we live in interesting times is is quite an understatement. There's it never seems like there's enough time to to keep up with everything that's happening and, and the pace of change. And you know, often I I try to take the perspective that if I read a headline or something like that, I have to think it will this matter in two weeks. And you know, there are certain things that we're gonna talk about today that absolutely will matter in, in two weeks, two months, two years. That I think a lot of people don't really realize the the significance of at this point, but mm-hmm. you know, I, going through your your LinkedIn, doing some research for this morning, I came across a quote that that you also sent me, and you said you think that the the tragic irony that history will remember this period by will be the fact that one asset Western investors will need the most, they own the least. So Canada, for example, owns nearly zero gold. So how does that play into your into your thinking here? And why does that make gold so important to you? Well, because I love owning assets when nobody wants them, when they're dirt cheap. You know, um, I have to say just a, a quick uh, shout out to Canaccord, which I'm very happy to be at because they're bringing all kinds of projects. Well, two weeks ago, I purchased a million ounces of gold on the ground in the U.S. for 60 bucks. Announced this company was trading for sixty million dollars with a million for sixty million market cap with a million ounces on the ground. Well, I think that's amazing because back in 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 twenty eleven, last time we hit nineteen hundred reserves on the ground went as high as three hundred dollars an ounce. Here I am paying sixty, mm-hmm. right? And during periods like the eighties and the thirties, reserves on the ground when nobody could get any gold, they were trading at the price of gold. So in the eighties, we got up to eight hundred on reserves on the ground, and in the thirties, thirty five bucks gold on the ground. So to me, it's an amazing opportunity to continue to buy into something that people will need, and the rest of the world is buying like crazy, but Western investors. You know, we're stuck with, uh, with uh, you know, buying the Dow and just looking at how long can this bubble last and writing as long as possible. Now, from uh, being a student of history, I know full well that taking that strategy is a little bit risky. And at the end of the day, what I will ask anybody that's not owning any any hedges to protect us from what's coming is, you know, how much money are you going to have at the end of that, right? And that's the, you know, the the, there's so many examples throughout history of people that were very, very wealthy, but they lost it all because they didn't see it coming. I personally think, you know, I've been preparing for what's what's in front of us since about 2015, 2016. I first bought gold in 2005, 2006, wrote it up to 2011, then reduced my allocations and then started loading up again at $1,000 gold in 2015. Well, as most people were walking away, I was adding and adding and increasing my allocation slowly. And now I'm sitting on a beautiful position and in, in, in something that I think will be will be so transformative as I see the monetary system shifting, that the, the paradigm shift that both Ray Dalio talks about, the currency reserve shift. And it's amazing because things like this only happen every 100 years and we're living right through it. And, you know, I think people are are at a loss. So there's a lot of opportunities, but there's a lot of a lot of challenges ahead. Mm-hmm. And and that I think is where we should we should be chatting. Mm-hmm. So Jaime, you know, when when we think about, you know, the let's say the the framework of how you 
you say you you rolled gold, rode gold up from let's say 05 to to 2011 what were some of the the markers to you that you thought it was time to get out of that trade well the the big marker was when gold gold first was at 1900 and it breaks down to 1500 in 2012 2013 to me that was that was just a normal pullback because we had gone to the other side and we needed to come back to to some level of of uh, of uh, normalcy in the price, right? So I thought twenty nine uh, fifteen hundred dollar gold was reasonable. It was the break to thirteen hundred that occurs in twenty thirteen. That was a complete surprise, and you know what? It, it comes at the very same time that that central banks are telling us that they're going to stop printing money because they have everything under control. And guess what? They accelerated the printing even more, but the price falls. So that disconnect to me was was a massive uh, problem. And so what I did is I went to 5%, which is, was the minimum. I, I, I had held gold. I always work in an asset allocation model. Asset allocation takes away the, the love and hate, the, the fear and greed equation. So mm-hmm. as something's going up, you're just cr- always trimming back, trimming back, right? And, and redeploying the asset to somewhere else. Well, when that break came, I went down to 5% and I waited. Once we got it around 2015 at 10,000, 1,050 gold, and it never broke 1,000, I realized, okay, this thing can't continue because by the same token, the fundamental inflationary pressures, which is all that money that's being printed by the central banks, is also accelerating. You know, today we're seeing the, 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 the tsunami of the consequences of all that money printing, but it's been building for how many years now? Mm-hmm. Right. So the only thing you can do as a rational investor, as, an, as, a, as, a, as a professional that, that is advising clients to say, OK, we were at five. Now we're going to be at 10. Then I increased to 15. Now I'm up to 30 to 35 percent. So we own a lot of these assets at the very same time that when you look at pension allocations, it's at zero. Nobody owns any pension funds are starting to go in. Finally. The question is going to be, are they going to be able to get the right assets? Right? You know, when you look at, at, for example, if you bring up that chart that I sent you, the HUI versus, versus gold, gives us a great example of the, the aberration of value that we have. So, Jaime, this is the HUI versus gold. My it, favorite chart. Your favorite chart here. And this That's really right. shows us a, a disconnect, you were saying, right? Well, if, we, if you look at it, so, so this is all the way back to... to um, the, um, 2011, right? The last time that gold was up here in the 1900. Now the orange line is gold. Mm-hmm. So it really shows us not only the, the decline right through from 2011 through to 2015, what we call the cup and handle, the breakout, but look at the aberration of value. What I was saying about having bought shares on the uh, reserves on the ground at 60 bucks. Mm-hmm. Well, if you look at the, at the HUI, which is the index of the gold and silver producers, Back in 2011, it was trading above gold on a relative basis, and now we're trading at a discount. In essence, the producers are making more money than ever. And by the way, gold and Canadian dollars for the Canadian producers is at almost 2,500 bucks, if not over 2,500. And here we are producing it at about 1,000 Canadian. So the profitability is amazing, but look at where the companies are trading. Mm -hmm. And that's because investors are too happy sitting on the Dow instead of realizing that maybe I should have a little bit of the lifeboat. Mm -hmm. You know, my attitude has been to continue to acquire. If you look at the bottom here in 2015, October, that's when I started building my positions. Um, and then I've continually added, and now you know I'm sitting on beautiful companies that are generating a lot of cash flow at the very same time that nobody owns them. So what I'm waiting for now is for that tie to come back in. Now mm-hmm. it's funny because it goes hand in hand with what I learned at Gordon Capital, where somebody said, uh, one of my mentors in the business said to me, money is a blob on a platter. And that blob will grow and decline, but it's always moving from one end of the platter to the other. Make sure you're sitting where it's been and where it's going, not where it is, right? And everybody is in the market instead of where it's going, which is back to gold because of inflation and what's going on around the world. And and I think this is very telling because of what's going on with the geopolitics, what's going on with Russia and what happened on March 11, 2021, on the day that they kick Russia out of the Western base SWIFT. Now, Swift to some people is a bit of a of a of a, of a misunderstanding as to what exactly it is, but the best way to understand it is to understand that it's an aqueduct. Mm-hmm. All it is is an aqueduct that transfers monetary payments around the world for payment of trade, right? 
On the Western aqueduct, the SWIFT, only US dollars and euros function in that aqueduct. The fact that they've sent Russia over to a brand new Chinese made aqueduct means that they don't have to work in US dollars and euros. And I'm pretty sure they will not want to function in that currency. Now, let me give another warning because it would be rather naive to expect uh, to expect the same fundamentals as when the um, as when the uh, petrodollar was set up not to be at play today. What do I mean by that? If you look at the petrodollar set up in 1975, it was the biggest energy producer at the time, Saudi Arabia, and the biggest energy buyer at the time, uh, the U.S., deciding on the currency by which we were going to trade energy. And that currency became the U.S. dollar, and it was traded in that SWIFT, right? Now, that also forces countries like Chile and the rest of the world that needed to buy energy to also start buying U.S. dollars. And so they started buying U.S. debt. And that's how we dealt with the fiat system after Nixon and pegs from gold, right? Now, it's a little naive not to understand today that the same mechanics are applying because today Russia is the biggest energy producer, not Saudi Arabia, and China and India are the biggest buyers, mm -hmm. right? And what they're deciding is what currency are we going to function within that brand new SWIFT? Is it an interesting that both Saudi Arabia, they wouldn't even visit, allow a visit by Biden and the United Arab Emirates, Venezuela and Mexico are siding with Russia. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they know that energy is going to transact with the biggest buyers of energy, China and India within this. So look at the news, the, the news cycle over the last two or three weeks. How is India going to pay for energy from Russia? How is Saudi Arabia going to transact in energy from China? What they're really discussing is how, what will be the form of balance of payments within this new SWIFT, right? And what came out just lately out of Russia is that they're going to, first they said, well, you got to pay in rubles. But then they said, well, we're going to back the ruble by a next quantity of gold. I, I can't remember the exact mathematics, but at the pass, at the value of the ruble about two weeks ago, it worked out to gold at about $1,500 an ounce. But what's happened since is that the ruble has started to appreciate. I wonder why. I wonder if those other buyers of, of, of energy, Russian energy, like Canada, like the US, because let's not forget that Canada purchases 250,000 barrels a day of Russian energy and the US almost half a million barrels. Mm -hmm. Well, it'll be kind of hard for them to turn on the tap that quickly, considering that we don't even have pipelines to deliver it to ourselves. Right. So energy independence is going to come crashing and going to become a problem rather quickly, a highly inflationary problem, because we can't replace this energy we're buying from Russia, especially when the rest of the world is also buying energy and they're all going to about to switch to a different kind of currency. Right. So it's very important what's happening. Look at look at Austria already said and Germany have already said prepare for some really bad period going forward. Bass, I think, was the one this morning, a uh, big fertilizer producer as to the cost of fertilizers with less Russian energy right now. It's going to be highly inflationary. And we're starting to see the the net effects of that, which is to some extent the, the shutdown of production of things. Look at what happened with nickel. Look at platinum, palladium, and all the other resources, because we set up this globalist system where we're not going to produce anything in North America. We're going to produce it in, in Asia and then buy it from them at a cheap value. Well, I think we're going to end up buying it from them at very, very expensive values. And that's the inflation that is unleashing because of all these problems. Now, on a nutshell, the, without getting too complicated, it's important to understand that every time the currency reserves have shifted throughout history, the biggest losers have been the countries with the most debt, because they're the ones that need to raise money to fund their debts and everything. And look at what's happening today with interest rates in, in, in the bond market. I've always said that's, that's the elephant in the room. Absolutely, Hami. And there's a, there's a lot to dig in there. So, you know, I, I want to kind of go back to one of the things that Russia did. You know, you said they kind of backed their currency with gold. Does that mean they they have basically put a floor into the price of gold now? Yes, pretty much. Because now that the currency is rising as people are buying it, it also is appreciating the the, the, the price of the commodity, not necessarily in the foreign in 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 our markets yet, 
But as a trade payment, you can either go and buy rubles to pay for Russian energy, or you can pay with gold by the back in it, right? So they're both now tied in tandem. Now that's important because China is sitting on the most gold of all these countries and they took it from us. They took it from the West since 2008 and guess who's the biggest buyer? Same thing with India. India is sitting by default with a lot of gold, they've always had it. So it's gonna benefit them, but think about Canada. Well, we don't have any gold. You know, we don't have any 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 um, any um, any hard assets back in our currency, and we don't have we don't produce enough energy for ourselves, even though we could. But we've decided to follow along with this green energy plan before you know putting the cart ahead of the horse um, and killing the horse at the same time, right? So so it'll be a long time before we can even generate the energy we need at the cost that's needed, right? Mm-hmm. So again. I think the, the the biggest takeaway for investors should be that they got to have some kind of a uh, of a uh, hold on a second to me that they, they they better have some kind of a of a an inflation strategy or, or inflation hedging strategy for their investments because inflation is going to eat away at a lot of their savings. Mm-hmm. At least it's going to cost a lot more to live. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. So how effective do you think these these sanctions are going to be that are being imposed by the West and and who do they really affect? Well, they're going to affect us because we still need energy. Right. Mm -hmm. So so the sanctions are about, well, we're not going to what was the sanctions that we're going to that we're saying today? Well, we're going to restrict their ability to 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 sell their gold. Well, that's nice and dandy, but they don't have to sell gold because they're going to get paid with gold for their energy. So they're really going to be net positive gold. We're the ones that don't have any gold, right? Well, uh, look at what happened with nickel, right? Isn't it funny that some Chinese bank was shorting nickel and all of a sudden they get caught with the short and the price of nickel jumps? Well, JP Morgan bails out those trades from the Chinese bank. And by the way, if you were sitting on options or future contracts of that nickel play and you thought you made money, well, forget it because they cancel all those trades. A, a key warning there, because I've always said you got to own it either on the ground or at the in a vault. But if you own a paper contract back in it, you're going to get diddly squat. And that's what happened to those all those all those nickel traders. Now. Let's talk about nickel for a second, because the jump in nickel was so high that the nickel coin, which is only 5% nickel in the US, jumped to 13 cents. That's how much it jumped. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think that's impressive, never mind and wait and see what happens when silver shorts go, because there we have an even bigger short. And again, is it the Chinese? Is it JP Morgan? Who cares? I don't really care who's doing the short. The shorts are in place. And force majeure, which is a, a term that people should start getting used to because that's exactly what happened with, with nickel. Force majeure means that we've run out and we have to we have to reset the price. Now, all that is doing is that we're losing control of the commodity market because what's happening with nickel right now, it's trading in the Asian market. It, everything is adjusting over to the new markets that are going to have the resources and we don't have them because we haven't been producing them. Which is one of the sidelines. That's why I was so happy to have bought gold on the ground in in the U.S. with another one of these projects that they mothballed in the '80s that have been coming to market over the last year. And thanks to Canaccord, we've been able to get in there and acquire quite a bit of them. Mm-hmm. Well, all these projects eventually are going to be gone, and they're going to have to be restarted. I'm actually feeling much better about mining jurisdiction in the U.S. than anywhere else because of geopolitical risk. Like I look at what's happening in Chile, for example where the new socialist government, what's their attitude? I think they're going to make the same mistake as Allende again. Let me let me tell you a little story, uh, just back up a bit. So my grandfather was a big industrialist in Chile. He, When I was born, he had built quite a bit of the infrastructure for the mining business. This is my mom's dad, right? He was a capitalist. But my father was a communist. And they would always be arguing. My father would be, oh, what about the laborers? What about the laborers, right? And then my grandfather was, well, what about capital? What about capital? Years later, when I started working in the financial business in Canada, I realized that the, the, they were talking about both sides of the coin. The one thing that we're never taught, you know, we, we talk a lot about capital and labor, but we never talk about how money works, which is the coin on both sides. You can't have labor without capital and you can't have capital without labor. Right. And I think that's where the big disconnect is. And that's where the big learning curve is going to come as to what is really money. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's where history really came to be. And it also connects me back to gold because 
it's important to understand as well that the reason why I'm a bit of a gold bug is because when I started in the business creating credit derivative swaps at the infancy of the whole derivative sector, that business was taught to me by the last generation of bond traders to have worked in a gold standard, mm-hmm. right? So I'm kind of like the last connection to those guys because then they retire and everybody younger than me has never even lived or worked in a gold standard. So they have no idea what gold is, which brings us back to why in North America, we have such a low understanding of the number one asset that they should be holding. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, uh, Jaime, as we, as we think about, you, you know, basically the, these unintended consequences, is it possible that with this conflict, most in Europe don't really realize, let's say, for example, the, the, what the consequences are of Russia actually shutting off the gas to, to Germany specifically, let's say? Well, again, let's be a bit of a conspiracy theorist there, because isn't it a lot better to blame Mr. Putin for the economic demise that's coming our way than our own central bankers Mm -hmm. for having mismanaged our fiscal situation, right? Chicken and an egg. So uh, again, let's not get involved in in trying to find blame as to it's better to to me to more analyze where the opportunity lies, Mm -hmm. right? And the opportunity definitely lies in the ownership of real assets versus paper assets, Mm -hmm. right? Because we're going from one cycle. I I bet you that, for example, um, you know, one of the investors that I really like is Jimmy Rogers. And I bet you that in the next interview I come across from him, he's going to be saying how two weeks ago he was buying the ruble. Right, because he doesn't get emotional. He just goes where where the money is. You're buying energy at 30% discount by buying the ruble two weeks ago. I would, you know, I wasn't in there buying it because I like gold. I, I think that's the place to be. Mm-hmm. But you gotta get off this uh, black and white world that we're being pitched on and try to start understanding how the puzzles are shaping up and where the opportunity lies. Right. I think that the the ownership of assets on the ground, real assets going forward. Pipelines, utilities, the same things. You know, I look at my 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 uh, equity income portfolio where I have the pipelines, the utilities, the income generators. The one thing that's lacking in most of those portfolios that I come across from from interviews with portfolio managers from some of the different mutual fund companies that they never add gold to the equation. And never mind blockchain. <laughs> and that's a completely different one. I'm happy that at Canaccord at least we're following the sector mm-hmm. and we're starting to come out with research. But the average analyst, the average portfolio manager out there, he has no goal. Now, gold is important because I manage that equity income portfolio exactly like those, but I'm outperforming those because of the gold component. The upside that we've had in the in the producers themselves has been pretty good since 2015. You know, you could have picked up Nico at 22 bucks, and here we're sitting at 75. Even though I think, in my opinion, it should be trading at least 100 percent to 150 percent higher than that to mm-hmm. reflect gold at 19, 2500 Canadian, right? But never mind. I'm happy to own it at 22, and I'm happy to send out in at 75 and add for new clients at this mm-hmm. level. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great, great opportunities out there. Absolutely. You know, and, and it makes me wonder, you know, as we think about not only the, the opportunities that you want to see coming, but more so the, let's say, the inflation side. So with, with the current trend of deglobalization here, that's going to have many impacts, so much so that it's almost hard to even think through all of them. So where do these impacts start to really show themselves and how far down the road do you see this going? Well, um, I look at that a little bit different. So I look at, at the fact that p- people better prepare. Look at Venezuela today. If you look at all economic unravelings, they always take two years. Venezuela today, the Russian republics, the Soviet republics in the 1980s, in the 90s, when everything falls apart, two years of coming to the bottom, and then we start the rebuilding. So I think that's what people should be preparing for, right? It happened in Chile, it happened in Argentina, it happened in Brazil. That's my Latin American experience. We just haven't lived through it in Canada since the 30s, right? And globally in the Western economies either, not to the extent of what I think what's coming, because we, we need a complete cleansing of the debts. Now, what is the positive of that side is that at least, you know, if you, if you really look at society today, we become a little bit too too selfish, a little bit too, um, what's that word that, um, uh, uh, not, um, sorry, it starts with an end, entitled, a little okay. bit too entitled to really understand, right? So, so as we go through, through these cycles, because it is a cycle, 
um, um, The Great Gatsby. What's Fitzgerald talking about, again, is that entitled society of the roaring 20s, right? The complete unaware as, as to our human, our, our, our brothers. Well, what happens through the depression is it's a complete new different cycle. We go back to the community. We go back to, to being a little bit more caring. You know, empathy starts. And so that's... Uh, um, right. So, so, so that shift is going to occur on the wealth side. It's a wealth transfer where things are transferring from paper assets to hard assets. And that's my environment had a position to actually benefit from that. Right. How to protect assets and wealth and benefit. You know, I, I'm always amazed at, at the John Hilton um, uh, history on how he buys five hotels for the value of the cash flow that they were generating in 1933 which was at a huge discount from the bank to the price that they were selling for in 1929. It's about being ahead of the curve and, and positioning yourself as an investor to really benefit from, from greed and fear. And right now you have to go to, to get away from everything that's being driven by greed and you start making rational decisions as to where, where to allocate funds, mm-hmm. right? Getting caught on the downside, you know, be prepared for inflation. Things are going to cost higher, greater, and it's going to affect a, a large content of the lower classes, right? So that again is going to create quite a bit of of economic dislocation that we, we're going to have to live through. Uh, but it's part of the cleansing process. Mm-hmm. So how, how effective do you think these these twenty five basis point interest rate hikes are going to be against the inflation? <laughs> what inflation is- at eight percent? With the, you know, the, the, with this inflation that that's, is. That's like showing up with this for a fire. <laughs> Not, <laughs> well, that's actually kind of winning. where I, where I pulled that question was there's a, you know, there, you can see this, this raging inferno and there's a guy throwing a little bucket of water, like, like right. a coffee. Like, bucket, exactly. Right? So, so again, let's go back to what I've been saying since 2015, because it's not the first time I've been talking about inflation. If you, if you rewind some of the interviews we've had mm-hmm. a while ago, I told you that one of the problems with inflation, it's an exponential event. It's not a linear event. And I said that bottom was what, at half half a percent inflation calculated the way they want to calculate it. Like you can't even hide it anymore. We're using the new math. We're at close to 8%. But the important point of that is this, is that we got down to half of 1%, I think it was. So, and it took, I think, nine months to get to 1.5. Then it took another nine months to get from 1.5 to three. Now we're already crossed three to six and we're going from six to 12. Mm-hmm. But the, 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 the time horizon is always the same. It's the doubling that's, that, that's accelerating. And that's the exponential effect of, of money dying. You know, it's funny. I was listening to our, our chief equity strategist, Tony Dwyer, and he was pointing out how right now balance sheets for banks look great. And they do mm-hmm. because we have that jump in, in spread so they can make some money. But then right off the bat, in the back of my head, what am I thinking was, the book When Money Dies, which is the, the best chronology of, of, of a hyperinflationary event, which was the Berkman Republic during the 30s. And one of the things, I think it was Rothbard who wrote it. I can't remember the, t- the, the, the author, but the one thing he points out is that inflation works beautifully at the beginning as the, as the tide starts to come in. But then once it gets over your knees and the tsunami hits you, mm-hmm. you're in trouble. And that's mm-hmm. what we're seeing is that the inflationary reversal of interest rates finally starting to go high is working well to do the banking system. But we have a problem. The problem is, is that you have all of these derivatives that are set up on the spreads between, you see, let's talk about derivatives for a second. Derivatives, I'm not lending you money. What we're doing is you're borrowing money by selling treasuries and I'm and, and lending me that money. But the, the key to that trade is the little spread between you borrowing on the one-year bond and me uh, lending out on a three-year bond. If that spread starts to wind it or shift, it will affect our trade, mm-hmm. right? So, 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 so the derivative market depends on stability within the yield curve. And I don't know if you've noticed, but right now we have no stability in the yield curve, right? So the fact that the Fed only raised 25 basis points, I think it has to do more with the fact that if they go any further, they're going to they're gonna unwind that, that derivative bubble. So I think going forward, all they can do is control it. Mm-hmm. So look at their balance sheet. They were supposed to taper, but what's happened, it's accelerated. All central banks have accelerated because at the same time that uh, the Chinese and the rest of the world is working on this brand new SWIFT, they don't need dollars anymore. They don't need that US debt. They don't need that European debt. So guess what's happening to yields? As they're selling those treasuries, yields are rising. 
But the Fed, all they can do is print money to buy up that that those bonds. Otherwise, yields will accelerate even more. Mm-hmm. Again, another signal that we're on the other side of the of the chasm, right? Of the other side of the of the debt mountain, where everything's beginning to unwind. And the new currency reserve that's being launched by 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 the energy producers in Asia, mm-hmm. I think it's amazing because it's also the currency reserve. That currency, that basket that they're going to figure out how we're going to trade energy between us. It's also you have to understand that it's the currency reserve that's going to be with us as the development of this Asian block that's going to influence the global economy for the next 30, 50, 60 years starts to set. Right. So we can't change that. So what's going to happen going forward is at some point, Canada is going to have to go back or highly likely Germany and Austria are going to have to buy some of that Russian energy. Well, guess what? They're not going to be buying in the old SWIFT. The, the Russians are going to say, well, forget that. Where's your rubles? Where's your gold? Mm-hmm. Show me show me real money. None of that printed stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. So so again, that's highly inflationary and you got to set figure out the puzzle. So to me, gold, silver still offer great opportunity to to enter. I'm looking at Chile, right? So 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 the Latin American experience. Actually, it's funny because the portfolios that I that I started were started right at that bottom in that chart that we were looking at in 2015, mm-hmm. right? Um, and Chile at the time when I was when I was covering Chile for Scotia Bank 20, 2014 and 2018, gold in Chilean pesos was 500,000. Pesos per ounce. Today, it sits at 1.5 million pesos per ounce. So again, a really good indication of what's happening to 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 the peso, right? But on a on a longer perspective, you know, Chile is a big producer of copper. Instead of nationalizing that copper, why don't you just if they're producing copper, they're also a big producing of silver because silver is an offset of copper. Well, why don't you just peg your peso? to silver the same way that that the rubles being pegged to gold and start working on a hard currency. Mm-hmm. The beauty of a hard currency as opposed to nationalizing the asset is that you don't you don't shy away from from capital, right? So look at what's happening with the ruble today is starting to appreciate. So with the peso, the benefit is is that all the citizens benefit as the currency appreciates, right? So I think it's the best it's the best solution. And by the way, that that program already worked for 200 years after the currency reserve reset of 1770, when we set the gold standard. Let's not forget that the Industrial Revolution was built on a, on a sound money system, and it works. Mm-hmm. To, to some extent, when I look at history, what we're about to unwind is what's starting in 2014, when the imperial powers, in order to control, they, what they said, well, let's get off the gold standard and just, just print money. Right. So so that's where we disconnect and that's where we're about to rebuild. If you look at it from a from a historical perspective. I mean, I know we, I just said a lot, but it's it's so much to talk about. Yeah. It, I mean, it, that's the thing is there's so many different pieces to this puzzle that are that are really connected. But, you know, I, I want to kind of get some kind of a, a framework to think about how this progresses, you know, as we as we think about how a progression of a nation's debt builds, at what point does it become extremely destructive to the currency? You know, when how about two thousand and eight? Well, absolutely. <laughs> when when two thousand and eight, but I, I want to say specifically, like, you know, when when foreign countries stop buying debt and it becomes solely financed by the country's own treasury, does this really start okay. to accelerate the destruction of the currency? Good, good question. Good question. So let's go back to the 30s and the deflationary hit of 1933, mm-hmm. right? When um, uh, who was it before Roosevelt? Um, Pre- Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, you know, when they bring everything back to the U.S. and then and then the debts implode in Europe, Right. We have a massive economic shutdown. Uh, at what point do we see it? Well, you know that that those accelerate like avalanches. So the best thing to do is just to be prepared for it. I think we're getting there. I think that at some point, because of what's going on right now on the debt side, who's going to fund all of these liabilities that are today sitting in pension funds? Right? Where's the money going to come from for, for those? Right. How is Canada? Look at the the level of debts we're carrying today. At least Chile, thanks to Pinochet, you know, they're sitting on twenty three hundred dollars per citizen of debt. So it's one of the lowest, the lowest debt per capita. Where where are we here in Canada? I think we're north of fifty thousand somewhere. I stopped counting a couple of years ago. It's crazy. Right. But 
again, so I can look at it two ways. You know, you asked me at, at some, I think when we were chatting before the interview, when do we look at live, leaving the country? Well, I'm not going to leave the country. I'm just going to benefit from the other side of that because I know that at the same token, you know, if, if, I, if I had had money in, in Argentina circa 1994, I would have been able to buy a beautiful, beautiful French apartment in Montevideo, you know, 4,500 square feet in the middle of downtown for dirt to nothing. Right. Mm-hmm. And now it's appreciated. So my attitude is a little bit different. I'm just going to take advantage of the opportunities as they come up. Mm-hmm. Sure, the government will try to tax us and I'm ready for greater taxes because it's going to be the only way. But that's the only way we give back to, you know, the the in, in a way, the, the 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 stupidities or the not stupidity, but the the the, 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 the levels of greed maybe. that we that we've achieved as a society. Right. Or, and, and irrationality as to what really can be done. You know, look at this silly program of, of establishing green energy without even having the energy to build the green energy first. Mm-hmm. Right. Now it's coming home to roost, but that creates a lot of opportunities. Look, we're not buying, building any pipelines, but those pipelines I own are dear and they're making quite a bit of cash flow. Same thing with the utilities. Right. So, so again, it's about positioning yourself. Mm-hmm. So would this real currency destruction also be accompanied by countries starting to sell U.S. treasuries that they already have? Well, I think that's already happening because they don't have to buy the, the those treasuries anymore to pay for energy, mm-hmm. right? And I think Saudi Arabia will be the next one to go. You know, I don't think they're going to get their gold from the U.S. I think that's been leased out already. So they'll be very happy to get paid with gold for, for their energy or some kind of a composition of that from China. We know mm-hmm. that China has the gold. Right. But the bottom line is they're not going to need the U.S. dollar. They're not going to need the euro. And more importantly, when 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 Europe needs to buy energy from Russia, they're also going to have to buy rubles and get rid of their of their of their euros for it. And if Canada doesn't get its act together, we're going to need energy from 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 Russia as well in order to supply our eastern our eastern borders because we're too stupid to build pipelines to take us across. You know, it's funny because um, I think we were talking uh, in the right before the last election, and you asked me who did I who did I um, the the last Canadian election, and you asked me mm-hmm. who did I who did I think might win, and I said, well, it doesn't really matter because. The real leaders won't come up until after we see what the real mess is, mm-hmm. right? What's the point of trying to choose leaders within the party of the Titanic instead of worrying about it after the ship sinks? You know, then we can figure out, well, who can build a ship, which is really going to be the number one, the, the the key takeaway from a leader going forward, right? Mm-hmm. That's kind of part of the the fourth turning, right? We're experiencing a time that is created by weak men that are going to create hard times, right? And then it's That's not right. until after that that we get great leaders again to bring us out of that mess. That's right. Uh, West Point's class of 1914, Marshall, Eisenhower, Patton, they all come out at the same time and they're the guys that fought the war. And then Eisenhower takes us in the leadership that takes forward mm-hmm. and warns us about the military industrial complex, which is another another hot potato that at least won't be able to be funded anymore. I think at some point that's also going to change. Mm-hmm. Right. And and I don't think I don't think uh, I don't think, you know, I, I look at the whole thing with Ukraine and the Ukrainian border has been in flux for so many years. It's just another reestablishment of the of the Ukrainian border. What's more important to me is so it's it's the it's the end of the great game for now. The great game is the control of Eurasia. The British figured that out in the 1800s. It's funny. I was listening to uh, before the Ukrainian war. Modi did a really really interesting speech where he said that to some point, Western economies or West Westerners have to figure out that what Asia is doing right now is redefining the mistakes left behind by the British. What he's talking about is Hong Kong and, and, and Taiwan and Afghanistan and Pakistan and all that, right? It, it's interesting how even the Saudis and the Iranians are getting along all of a sudden, right? Because they know that, well, we're going to be selling energy to China and India, these are the biggest buyers, and how are we going to be paying? So a lot of a lot of rearrangement of the of the of the of the chairs of the global 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 geopolitical picture are, are in change, right? And gold is within them, right? It, it's silly not to understand that when you think about how Asian things and think uh, both India, Pakistan, all of them, Iran, they all understand what gold is. Mm-hmm. So 
Jaime, when when we think about you know the the other side, let's say the other side of of your portfolio, you're very interested in in blockchain and cryptocurrency. The EU just announced new rules banning private crypto transactions under the guise of anti money laundering laws. So is this just showing us how desperate some of these nations are getting for tax revenue? No, I, yeah, I think it's noise. I think it's noise. I, I, what's more important was the other vote that they the the, the vote they had about three weeks ago regarding. Um, uh, proof of stake versus proof of uh, they always get those two confused, but that was an important vote because that that's another and and more importantly, what I thought was really interesting was that before the Ukrainian attack, uh, the Russian central bank had said to had had um, on a Monday, I think it was, they had advised that they should do exactly what China did, which was completely ban the mining and the trading of all cryptos. But then the finance ministry came out and said. Uh, no, I think we should we should just uh, monitor, uh, monitor, um, regulate, and continue doing it. And then Putin on the Friday says, "No, we're going to monitor, regulate, and continue doing it." Which is quite interesting because if you follow what what happened in Ukraine and uh, and uh, Russia when the ATM machines you weren't able to take as much money out, well, you could actually still buy uh, blockchain Bitcoin. On online, right? So it didn't shut that down and it was very bullish. What I like about blockchain is the fact that I, and, and, and don't get me wrong, I bought my first Bitcoin at five bucks, even though I lost it because I did it through Mount Gov. It used to be a, a, a game and I set up an avatar. It was the only way to buy it, but I did read the white paper early on. So I understood it as electronic gold or electronic currency, mm-hmm. right? The beauty automatically to me was the fact that the technology is a decentralizing technology. It gives us the power not to need a banking system. And that's the important part that that as we're going to go through this, if you really look at, at the fight, the electronic fight going on right now between central banks and blockchain is the fact that they you have a bunch, what, 200 central bankers around the world that currently have full control of the monetary system. It's a centralized control. Right. But what's really coming unwound is that centralized control because they've completely abused what they were controlling at. Right. It's funny. I wonder what's going to happen when people wake up to the fact that, wait a minute, we're in the hook for all the money that central banks have printed. You know, it was never their money. It's our money. Right. So how is the government going to. Right. So so the whole thing's coming unwound, that centralized control. But to rebuild it, we have a centralized, a decentralizing tool that is already working globally, Mm -hmm. right? And I think that adoption is gonna just accelerate from here. So in essence, what I think we have is is an internet uh, type of setup circa 1996 that's growing even faster, whose whose input or or whose uh, redeployment is gonna accelerate even faster as everything falls apart, because here we have a Titanic that is right beside it that's already working. Right. Mm-hmm. So the ship is already built. No need to recreate it. So I think the technology is going to take off and it's going to set up a beautiful future because we're not going to need so many systems. So the disruptive abilities of blockchain is going to be even greater than than uh, than than the Internet. But not for for you see, the, the blockchain right now is developing the storage of, of data within it is happening. I'm talking about even a further, but it's it's the use of it as a currency transfer system. So don't confuse the two between gold and, and Bitcoin. I, I've always said that, that blockchain is the solution to gold's problem. And gold's problem is the fact that decentralized system has control over the paper price. Mm-hmm. Well, blockchain offers a solution of something new, so it frees it up, right? So they're in tandem. And that I always say that gold and silver are about cleaning the monetary past, the fiscal imbalances. Blockchain, is how we're going to rebuild the future, which is beautiful. Uh, that's interesting to think about, Jaime, and, and then kind of apply the same framework that you know the the problem that gold has that you just brought up, and then think about how the the futures trading is going to start affecting the Bitcoin price. Do you do you see that as a concern? Forget about the futures. The futures is noise because the, as we go into uh, away from the fiat system and back to a hard currency system, all the future trades, anything that that related, you know, is going to be like pitching. Uh, you know, people are not going to listen to it, 
once once your your savings at the bank. Look, the light came on in Canada. The amount of calls I got after the the bank the banking system here grabbed assets of the of the truckers was unbelievable. Right, people woke up all of a sudden to realize, wait a minute, how can somebody how can somebody grab my assets? Right, so a lot of people they weren't pro truckers or anything like that, but they noticed, right? So this, since one of the things that I've been talking all along about was how to prepare outside of the system is why I'm at Canaccord, not at Scotiabank, right? Why I've, I've got my clients uh, um, who's at, I have their assets separated so that they're not within the, the structure. What happened to the futures, uh, to the ETF holders of, 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 of nickel, of nickel contracts? Well, they lost them all, right? Mm-hmm. All that is, that facade is going to disappear. Mm-hmm. So again, you know, it, it, everything that is happening around us further emphasizes a lot of the, the things that I've been saying, why you should have a, some cash at home, why you should have some silver at home in case the worst case scenario does play out, right? And I think the worst case scenario is going to play out because we have liabilities that can't be covered. Mm-hmm. It's impossible. Uh, I mean, you know, we've we've talked about you know increasing interest rates by these nominal percentages. What is the effect going to be on the, for example, the Canadian housing market that has been you know absolutely red hot over the past about year and a half? Is, is that going to really bring that market back under control or or even? Kind of crash. Um, well, the people's ability to pay for debt is going to, you know, as 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 the cost of money starts to increase to more realistic levels, mm-hmm. people's ability to carry that debt is going to suffer. Uh, housing markets always crash because banks stop lending, though, right? So, so, so I think there will be some continued strength within it. Uh, you know, a fool and his money. As long as they're lent money, they're going to continue to apply. But I think at some point, you know, interest rates not. The fact that they're not rising, that rates are only up 25 basis points when inflation is at 8%, mm-hmm. well, they have to raise them quite a bit higher to kill inflation. You know, people better wake up to the fact that they don't want to, they can't kill inflation. They've always said they wanted inflation. Well, here it is. Now they have a different problem. It's about managing that inflation and managing expectations. Mm-hmm. I don't think they can raise interest rates because without killing the the stock market. Now look at what's happening in the bond market. We have yields now in the two-year bond is above the 10-year bond, I believe, which is crazy, mm-hmm. right? Now, but the 10-year bond also sets uh, the, the mortgage rates in the US. So that's already starting to affect the housing market. Um, you know, we have um, the, the but, if, but hold on, back up away, because most people with uh, mortgages are sitting on floating mortgages, right? Mm-hmm. So so they haven't really locked in that long-term rate yet, and that's going to be very costly when that occurs. The more important thing is that that uh, that inflation continues building while inf- while interest rates are so low. But the problem is for the Fed is that if they raise interest rates too much, then they kill the stock market. But the stock market is becoming a little bit of an aberration when you have the dividend yield in the S and P five hundred what at one point three one point five. But the 10-year bond now is at 2.5, 2.4, and you have the two-year bond above that. So it's crazy. At some point, dividend yields have to come back down to reflect inflation better. You know, inflation at 7% for the, and, and I'm only getting 1.5% on my dividend. Well, that savings not going anywhere. But in order to go somewhere, the stock market has to correct. So you see the side effects of everything start to unwind. Now, I'm not saying that the stock market will correct because let's not forget the example of Venezuela. The best performing market as Venezuela was in its hyperinflation phase was the stock market of Venezuela because people couldn't get their money fast enough and they were buying the stock market in order to buy something. That's why the stock market went up a lot, but its currency was declining very fast. Mm -hmm. So you know the stock market could crash here, but if we go into hyperinflation, Man, it could go to 100,000. Who knows? Because the debts are so big. All I can tell you is that in, in that environment, gold and the gold companies are going to go through the roof because at some point the reality is going to come 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 home to roost, right? The, the, the one chart actually that I sent you, put up the, the, the chart with that yellow line because that, that's an important one to, to give a reference of where we're heading. Now, now, what's important about this line is that that line is reflective of the rise of both uh, money creation by central banks, all central banks around the world, and the price of gold. 
Mm -hmm. Up to about the point where the gold falls back in 2013, mm -hmm. that gold was keeping up with money creation. And, and money creation today is going through the roof. Now, that star that I put there, that was the year that, that was that's the end of 2017. That's when Terry Duffy, the head of the COMEC, says that if you look at what's going on around the world now, gold should be sitting around six to seven thousand dollars. Well, money creation has continued to increase. So go back to that that nickel example. When this facade falls apart, gold I think is going to go quite a lot higher. Now, if we look at it, gold in another from another perspective, when you look at the tonnage of gold versus the energy trade on a global basis. And if we were paying with gold for energy, well, that number gets a lot higher because then we were looking at a currency shift, a different animal. And that's what I always said, that if we're going for a currency reserve shift, as I thought we were, because it's the only way we can deal with the debts, gold's going to have to go a lot higher to clean the system. Mm -hmm. Right. So to me, that's a beautiful thing to be owning the assets that the world's going to need most at a time that nobody owns them, mm -hmm. or at least Seems Western investors. Mm -hmm. Seems kind of ironic that the head of the COMEX was saying that gold is undervalued. <laughs> well, I think at some point they're all going to figure out that, that wow, what an opportunity we had. It's funny. It's like Warren Buffett in, in 98, 99. Nobody wanted to buy him. And that was the time to be getting in, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, before we wrap up, why do you kind of really separate your portfolio into two distinct categories there? Oh, because um, when I established those two portfolios, I, uh, the, the challenge was the, the challenge was that I was I was um, I was covering all the family offices and pension funds in Chile for Scotiabank. But every time I went in to talk to them, I realized that they were all dealing with either a, a European or a, or, a, or a U.S. institution, right? So I needed to offer something completely different, and I thought. I might as well offer two separate portfolios. One is one was just a, a precious metals portfolio for an institution that said, you know what, I already have what Scotia is already offering, but I don't have no gold. Mm -hmm. So here's my allocation into that portfolio alone, right? The other one was the overall portfolio, which was exactly that diversified blue chip portfolio, but with a gold content for the for the Scotia Bank client that the, the institutions I would say. You know what? I like the strategy. I don't want to take just the gold one, but here's X amount of money to put into that diversified portfolio with the inflation hedge. And that's why I set them up. And if you look at the at the, at the performance numbers that I sent you, which was actually to February, it was actually extremely, I'm very happy with the way the portfolio is set up because you know, we've already hit bottom and we're looking at starting the next wave up. Like gold at 1900, I think the, the bottom's already set in. We're just waiting for the next breakout. And there's that chart. Bring up the chart for gold long term because that is a beautiful cup and handle chart. And I've never seen a bigger one. Uh, Sorry, I shouldn't say that because there's a bigger one for silver. Silver mm -hmm. is not a, a 2015 to, to 2022 chart. It's a 1980 to 2022 chart in terms of how long that cup and handle are forming. So I'm, that's why I'm more bullish for, for silver than gold. But again, back to, that's why I have the, the two separate portfolios. And by the way, the portfolios have done what they're, what they, you know, if you look at the, at the statistics as tracked by Canaccord, on the drawdowns, when the markets come comes down, the portfolio doesn't come down as much as the market. And on the, on the, on the way back up, the portfolio does, does uh, does rebound much faster. So if, if you zoom in, so you see where it says maximum drawdown. Mm -hmm. So the, the TSX S&P would go down 22 and the portfolio only goes down 14. Mm -hmm. And then the upside capture is way bigger than the than the index, right? What that is doing, that's, you know, over since, since 2018, when we brought the portfolio over, it's doing what it's supposed to do. We'd offer that hedge against, uh, against um, uh, for inflation, mm -hmm. right? And that's the fact that we've gone from a thousand dollar gold to now nineteen hundred, and the producers have also moved, though nowhere near where they're going, right? So, so that inflation, that that's just showing that it's stealth in terms of the inflation protection that the portfolio is offering. But when it finally goes, then it's gonna it's gonna deliver what it's that what it's what it was designed to do, and it's all cash flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's like you say, that's the important thing is to really know the role of each of these assets, the role that they play, and to be able to have the perspective to kind of get into those before they really 
end up having to to play that role and everybody starts chasing them right correct and I, and i think um uh, and i think um because i wow it's one o'clock already we've been chatting for quite a while uh, i think the one takeaway that investors should understand and and that hedge accordingly uh that you that that i have to say you 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 implemented years ago uh stands you know clear now in terms of you have to hedge accordingly and protect your assets, mm-hmm. protect it from inflation, because I think what comes next is going to be that inflationary tsunami that's in front of us. If you don't see it now, well, I, I think you you better stop and take a, a serious look because it's getting more, more expensive on people's wallet and it's only going to get worse. Absolutely. Jaime, I want to uh, thank you for sharing your perspective and everything with us today. Of course, you're very active on on LinkedIn at Jaime Carrasco. And on Twitter, you kind of link to all the same stuff at IJ Carrasco as well. Jaime, thanks mm-hmm. so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. Pleasure having me. Thanks for the chat. It's always, a, it's always good chatting with you, Tom. Excellent. Thanks. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.